You're listening to 50 Pirates in 50 Days on the Sports Objective Podcast. A new era of East Carolina football is here and will begin on August 31st when Mike Houston leads the Pirates into action at NC State. Between now and then, join us for a daily trip down memory lane as we experience Pirate football through the words of the men who made those memorable moments happen. Here's your host, Bubba Rosenbaum. Welcome to the Sports Objective Podcast, continuing on with our 50 Pirates, 50 Days feature, taking you from now up to August 30th, the day before the Mike Houston era will kick off against the NC State Wolfpack in Raleigh. And now we're very excited to be joined by a former Pirate linebacker from the late 80s and early 90s, Ernie Lewis. Ernie, welcome into the show. All right, all right. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, and we appreciate your time. I look forward to reminiscing on your days in the purple and gold. Um, first of all, t- and tell Pirate Nation about your recruitment and your path from Sanford, Florida to ECU back in the late 80s. Well, we've, uh, like, there's, there was a connection at ECU um, with me and Jeff. Um, <clears throat> I was originally um, headed towards Florida State. Um, a couple things happened as far as recruitment, and Jeff and I, you know, we've always wanted to go to school together. And um, when I changed my mind on Florida State, I still was, you know, shopping to see where I wanted to go. And an old pirate, Reggie Branch, um, who is also from our hometown, recommended that we take a visit. And once we took our visit, which was our first visit together, it was just something about, it was just something about the school. More importantly, it was something about the team that was already in place, the players, how – and, you know, it's the same with every recruiting trip. You know, you get somebody, they, you know, they take you under their wing and they, they show you around. But it just felt – for me, it just felt different. You know, just such a such a brotherhood. Um, and, you know, that's really how we wind it up. At uh, at uh, ECU. Um, during your time as a pirate, you were a part of a couple of different transitional periods, and going from Art Baker to Bill Lewis, and then also Coach Lewis to, to Steve Logan. Um, after that '88 season, Coach Baker was let go. Uh, you had Coach Lewis coming in, a very strong reputation as a defensive coordinator down at Georgia. So, talk about that that transition. Well, and, and Coach Baker was. Um, you know, you know he was he was a, a different type. Like he never he, he never swore, um, and like I still use some of his language today, like frapping and you know get the frap out of here and stuff like that. <laughs> Coach Lewis brought a level of intensity that um, that was needed in order for us to take the next step. Um, detail oriented, no detail, no no detail um, would go by that he wasn't aware of. Um, and for for me, you know, having a defensive minded coach, because um, you know a lot of times, you know, offense is always looked at in a different way. I won't go into how much I hate offense, but um <laughs> having a defensive coach, he just brought a level of intensity that I hadn't experienced um, at ECU um, up to that point. And, you know, he had starters on special teams. I rem- Like, I remember um, the one loss that we had, I might be getting ahead of myself, but the one loss we had against Illinois during the Peach Bowl season, um, he had taken a lot of starters off special teams. And, like, one of the first things he said in the locker room was, I can tell you this, we're going to go back to having all starters on special teams. And, you know, that that's just how he was. You know, he felt like he had kind of got away from that. But just the level of intensity was night and day between Coach Baker and uh, Coach Lewis. And Coach Lewis really ran the program more of a business, um, you know, he was a part of everything. He had his hand in everything, but he ran it like a business, and and he was a CEO where he was able to step back and let his coaches 
um, handle their business. Um, but just that level of intensity was just completely different. And you you move forward to Coach Logan. Um, Coach Logan was a mixture of of both. Um, of course, he was offensive minded, so everything geared around offense. Um, during practices and, and preparation, but he still had that that same um, level of intensity. But he was a mixture of both uh, Coach Baker, Coach Lewis, not as intense as Coach Lewis was, but he still had his moments. Absolutely. Um, going back to Coach Lewis, uh, that 89 or those 89 and 90 seasons, um, Pirates played some pretty good football and didn't necessarily show on the record right around 500 both seasons, yep. but you had, you had near misses uh, against the likes of Syracuse, Pittsburgh, Georgia, and others. Um, so, so talk about some of the, some of those uh, near misses and just the building process. And it really seemed as though, uh, you know, looking back on it, um, or even like back then, uh, looking forward that you could, um, see the 91 season, a special season, not necessarily 11 and one, but you saw, you saw the winds coming. Yeah, and it was, and you know, that that's the part that like really, you know, that bothered you because you know, like you you sit in the locker room and you see the talent that's in the locker room. Like you can just sit in the locker room and you can say, he's going pro, he's going pro, he's going pro, he's going pro, he's going pro. He's going pro. So you know it didn't have anything to do with, with talent. And I think a lot of times during those seasons what happened was for us from from my perspective was just was depth like like we could go you know starter for starter with a lot of teams, but the depth people coming off the bench like there we didn't have that backup that a lot of the bigger schools would have, so you know things change not only with coach Lewis coming in coming into that special season we had. But along with that, you know, we got a strength coach, Coach Connors, that to say he w- was intense would be an understatement. Just the way that he trained us, the way that we worked, like rolling into the season, like people, we, we had the idea that we had something special. Um, and people may have more talent than we did, but no one was going to outwork us. No one was going to outwork us. And, like, he took pride. Like, it was a timeout, and the other team is on one knee and, and slipping up water, and whoever is on the field, be it offense or defense, everybody's standing up, standing tall, ready to go. Like, he took pride in that. And that just brought a level of confidence um, with us. And it was just that time just to put every, everything just came together. You know, I just think about certain players, you like Cedric Van Buren. Um, third and long, I would rather I wouldn't want anybody in the backfield on third and long other than Cedric Van Buren. You know, wasn't the biggest, wasn't the fastest, but if there was a first down needed, he's getting that first down. You know, and then like Jeff Blake Jeff really, really came into his own. Um and even though, you know, we still had um Coach Logan calling plays, you know, a lot of things, when they put Jeff back in that pistol, sort of shotgun, like, we were unstoppable. And you got people, you know, we had JUCO transfers in, um, George Kuntz. We had uh, uh, Deion Johnson, um, you know, and he just started building, like, weapons around him. And as, as we were in spring training, you like, man, we're, we're kind of loaded. like. We might be able to do something. And, you know, after the loss of Illinois, it just, it was, it just left such a bad taste in our mouth. And uh, from that point on, you know, it was just a, like a slow burn of enthusiasm and energy coming through that it just got contagious. And, and I just never forget the one point when, because Coach Lewis, a lot of people outside of the team don't notice, but Coach Lewis used to make T-shirts every week during that during that season, and um, you know we had a couple big wins, and he printed up this T-shirt 
um, with a bullseye on it saying the hunt, the hunter has now become the hunted because, you know, we're getting press and, and, uh, people are, are starting to come in to visit and, and interviews and want to talk to this person and that person. And then it, it kind of just, you know, kept us humble enough to know that we are doing something special, but at the same sense, like from that point on, like we're going to get everyone's best effort, you know, so. It was just a, it was a special time for us. You referenced those T-shirts. Obviously, one, the most popular one, probably at least from the outside looking in, uh, was the "I Believe" shirt. Um, and I then, of course, that. I, I, I still have that. I, and I don't know, I don't know who's responsible for "I Believe." I don't know because, like, you know, there was a groundswell of "I Believe," like not only on the team but like throughout the fans and the, the students in the stadiums like i don't know who was responsible for that i mean it's on my peaceful ring um but like we 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 bought in and i think that was the hurdle for a lot of us um in terms of those near misses was we finally just like okay let's let's just do what we came to do listen to coach and and not deviate and you know and i i remember and I still use a lot of stuff when I used to coach. Like, you know, there's three phases of the game. If you win two, you gonna you're going to win the football game. Offense, defense, and special team. You win one of those, you win two of those, you will win the game. You win all three, it's gonna be a blowout. And that was our focus going into the game. Like we're gonna win two of these. A couple of times we were able to win all three. But it was just it was buy in. Absolutely buy in. And you know, opportunity met with the ability that I know we had on that sideline and we kind of got some depth and some special JUCO transfers in and we were able to be something really special. To elaborate a little bit more on that, I believe mantra, like you said, uh, it took on, I mean, it really took off. Um, you, you heard the fans chanting it at games, specifically the Peach Bowl. I mean, there we were down 34 to 17 uh, yep. with, with uh, eight minutes and change or whatever left on the clock. Yep. <laughs> and, um, and so at that point, um, with, with the crowd chanting, we believe, I mean, it, I mean, 30,000 strong. And it, it was just something that it made the hair stand up and gave you goosebumps. Um, and just going back and watching it all these years later, and it still has the same effect. Absolutely, man. And I remember, like, it was one of the earliest football games I've ever played because it was like at 1130 in the morning or something like that. Right. And I remember, like, it was brisk. It was a brisk day in Atlanta. And as I'm leaving the hotel, um, my butterflies, I started getting butterflies, like, way too early. And I was just like, <laughs> I need to calm myself down, calm myself down. And as I, as we're riding, I'm just like, I'm just thinking to myself, I just, I need a sign. And I'm just riding, I'm just looking around. And I'll never forget, like, right around the Capitol, like we roll up and it's you know it's winter time so everything is pretty much dead and then out of nowhere there were these purple and gold flowers like like they had just been planted and from that moment the butterflies went away and I was like well we got this we got this and I remember distinctly in the game when we got behind um you know there's some people who just handle their business but they're not vocal. Like Dave Daniels is probably the most quiet. He's a he's the most quiet person I've ever met in my life. And when you hear Dave Daniels on the sideline getting excited and screaming and yelling, like it took me aback. I was like, "Look at Dave!" And it just got to the point where, as a unit, we was like, "There's no way that we're gonna lose this game. It's not." And I think the moment when Coach Logan made the decision to drop Jeff back and put him in shotgun changed the whole trajectory of that game. I mean, like we scored a touchdown yesterday because it was so it was it was so unstoppable, and it it's it's like it's always been. Like you know, offense goes out there and they handle their business. All it does is energize the defense so that we want to go out and just shut them down and do the exact same thing. And when once we 
drop back and put Jeff in shotgun and, and offense start scoring, the whole idea as far as the defense goes is like we're just going to get stopped. We're, we're going to bend. We're going to we're not going to break, and we're going to put the ball back in offense's hand. We're going to put the ball back in Jeff's hand, and we're going to do some special stuff. And uh, like I, I for the life of me, like I can't even. I can't even remember, and I have the game. Um, a good friend of mine put it on DVD for me. I can't remember how we got behind. All I remember is coming back down. Like that's the only that's the only memory I have, and it all started with offense um, getting a shotgun, because once you go right down the score. That was a, a you know an effort and defense coming together. It was like we have got to get stopped, and the rest is history. Yeah, it really is. Um, that's what kind of uh, m- moving on, um, or actually not not necessarily moving on from that season, but one of the questions we've asked some of your former teammates um, uh, regarding that season uh, when you would get home from the likes of a uh, upset win at Syracuse, and and then you had the airport just flooded with Pirate Nation. Uh, talk about that. The most um, probably, and I've done a lot, and I've traveled, and I've, I mean, I've been a part of a lot of stuff. But that was, for me, the most special. That is, other than, you know, kids being born and things of that nature, that was the most special event of my life. It was just because, you know, you know, coming to ECU and and and, and kind of being treated like 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 step kids or some of the other bigger schools in the, in the state. Not to mention, you know, my freshman year at ECU, eight of the teams that we played all went to bowls and were competing for the national championship. And one of the teams we played actually competed for the national championship, West Virginia. So, like, we were always like at one point we were homecoming for a lot of people and to get up there and do what we did in Syracuse. And I'm not going to like, we were, we were just absolutely amazed and just the, the hat, the excitement, like that was the point where we was like, just line them up. We're going to be able to beat anybody you guys put in front of us. And, you know, it's a long flight, and everybody's kind of, you know, we still have that buzz going on from the wind. And, you know, to land, and you're like, you're looking in the, inside the airport, and you're like, what are all of these, what are these people doing here? And to yeah. walk in the airport and have the media and just a row of people. And a lot of people don't, like, people don't understand, but, from where did we used to fly out of? Was it uh, what's it? Kinston, Kinston, from Kinston to Greenville on the side of the road for the entire trip. There are people on the side of the road with their lights on, honking horn, screaming. I've never understood. I, I've never seen anything <laughs> like it. And then when we get to campus, there's a makeshift pep rally going on. And I I don't know the exact time, but it, it's 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 late at night, and it was just like I just like I hate the time that I grew up in because like there's no cell phones, the cameras to capture all of this, and like when you tell people, people are like yeah man yeah whatever. But it was it was one of the, it was one of the most amazing events of my life um, from um, from sports. Because I know where we, I know where, I know where we came from. I know what we've been through, and the trials and tribulations that we've had. And you know, people of Greenville and all the ECU fans have always stood by us. But that night was a combination of everything, all the blood, sweat, and tears that we've gone through. Um, it seemed like we were recognized, and from that moment on, it was just, it was amazing. It was absolutely. Amazing. I remember going, I remember wearing my Letterman jacket going to buy subs or going to get pizza or whatever. I, and like, you couldn't pay for anything. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was just, it was, but it was, just, it was just that type of support where you go into a game, you, 
you get kind of selfish because you go in the game and you don't want her to stop. So like we like we gotta win because we gotta keep this going. And uh, it all started for me. It started with Syracuse. It was one of the most amazing nights um, coming to that airport and just seeing those people all the way on the road and highway back to Greenville was one of the most astonishing, amazing events I've ever been a part of. One of the other remarkable games from that season that had so many remarkable games um, was that home win against Pittsburgh. And they were very good. They were ranked. And um, they had a late lead. And then we know how it ended uh, with Jeff Blake diving into the end zone for a two-point conversion and the defense having to go out and get a stop. I remember that. I I remember that game because that was the first. That was the first and only game. Um, I got hurt. I got a stinger, like a really, really bad stinger. Um, and I couldn't. I lost the feeling in my left hand. Um, and the, I guess probably the thing that hurt the worst is that I'm on the sideline and I'm getting treatment. And I I can't I can hardly see what's going on offense and defense. And finally, I just stood up and just pushed everyone away and just went and just started cheering on the sideline. That was that was to to do that in Greenville to have that win in Greenville with all of the accolades that Pitt rolled in with and and they were loaded. They had a really good squad. But well, us, Alex Alex Van Pelt at quarterback. Yeah, they had a they had a really really good start. I mean, good squad. But you know, it's it's we believe. You know, it's it's tired nation, and I really do believe that along with the intensity and everything that we brought on towards the end, I think it was a, a will of of the crowd also that willed us that we were not going to let them come in and beat us. Um, and they, I mean, I, I don't remember where they were ranked, but they were, they were, they were up there pretty good. And no one thought we could beat Pitt, uh with the squad they had at that time, but it was, it was a really fulfilling win. Um, and, uh, I just remember running to grab Jeff with one arm. And just, I just couldn't believe. And it just, just the eruption when, when he, when he sneaks into the end zone and that eruption, that crowd, like those things, like, things like when, you, when you're an athlete, man, like me and my brother joke all around, joke all the time. It's like, man, you still hit a crowd because you don't want to let it go. Um, and that, that's one of the moments, like, I still hit a crowd. It was amazing. Yeah. I mean, um, that, the We Believe um, highlight video capturing that season is on YouTube. And that's, if you go back and watch it, they have a field level shot and uh, you can see the stadium just visibly shaking. And then I think yep. you see, you see, for some reason, I have this just kind of ingrained in my, in my memory, probably as, as many times as I've seen it. <laughs> but, uh, Keith Arnold, our center at the time, it seems like it was, was was running off the field, and he just like jumped up in the air and then rolled on the ground on his butt. It was just, and <laughs> people were just going out of their minds. It was just it's one of those things that you you couldn't uh, write a script for. You couldn't, and if it was a uh, <clears throat> if it was a Hollywood movie, like really, there's an, I mean, especially the way that it started and the way that it ended, like if it was a movie. Like people would be like, like that, that can't ha- that that's not gonna happen. That can't happen. But it was it was magical, and it was a moment of time, man. Where you know, because you you see and you know other athletes who go to some of the bigger, more prominent schools and the things that they do, and from a day to day, and like they're winning bowls and they're doing this. When when it when it finally happens. Um, to you, like it's it's almost a, it's almost like it's hard to put in words, but it's just like it's fulfilling because of everything that you've done. Finally, you get a taste of that, you know, and just having a taste of that throughout that whole season, 
from the time that we were first ranked, it was just something that you, you like, we didn't want to let go of that. And it, it may be for selfish reasons, but, um, like, we didn't want to let go of that. And we wanted to continue that drive and continue that momentum. A few minutes ago, you were talking about uh, playing West Virginia early in your career. I know your your senior season with the Pirates, uh, you had a very memorable moment, uh, uh, a fumble return up up in Morgantown against West Virginia that is still the longest fumble return in East Carolina football history, 97 yards for a touchdown. Uh, take, us, yep. take us through that. Well, it, and it happened, it, was, it, it felt like it was a slow motion. Um, like, West Virginia also got up on us, and um, we needed something to happen to change, you know, change that momentum. And actually, a couple series before that, um, I think it was Bernard Carter blocked the field goal, and I scooped it up. And, um, you know, I was in so much traffic with the, when I scooped up the field goal, I got probably about 30, 40 yards, but but I got caught. So fast forward to that play. Um, it's on the goal line, and, you know, our read is run first as a backer. So as soon as I take my steps forward, I can see the quarterback is actually dropping back to pass the ball. But I could see his hand. He didn't have the ball um securely enough and I anticipated him fumbling so when he did fumble once I scooped it up and he tried to grab me by my leg as soon as I stepped out of his arms I know it was just going to be a footwork a foot race but I was nervous because they had an Olympian sprinter on their squad and I, I was just like my the whole time I'm like I can't get ran down from behind I can't get ran down from behind and I don't know if it was Greg Grandison or Greg Floyd, but one of them bumped him enough where <laughs> I was just able to just let it eat. And I never forget, because Clayton Driver, um, we're still really good friends. And I remember him telling me as he's watching this, he was like, he's not going to make it. He's not going to make it. He's not going to make it. He's going to make it. I can't believe he's going to make it. This boy just scored a, a 97 yard touchdown. Um, it was, it was amazing. Um, um, it put us back. It actually put us back in the game. And, um, we had a miscue on the offside, on the onside kick, which really pretty much cost us the game. But it, not only was it, it was an amazing individual achievement for me. It, it actually put us back in the game where we could win the game. Um, but we had a, you know, an onside kick that didn't go on the way it should have. Um, but it was, it was, it was, it's one of my, you know, one of my highlights from my career, um, at ECU, uh, cause it was just, it was just really an amazing, amazing time. And it was like, you know, like we couldn't, it's like we couldn't do anything during that game, and it was just it was frustrating. But we started having a little success, and that put us close enough to where we could, if we score, we could actually win this. Um, I was really proud of not just the fact that I was able to get a touchdown, but what it did, what it, where it put the team. Um, you know, I had a chance to go ahead and, and uh, win that. But it was uh, the whole time. I think all I'm thinking about is. Um, the sprinter, like somebody blocking, somebody blocking the whole <laughs> way down. That was my biggest concern. Because you but, break out like that, like you you get caught from behind, you don't want to see the film. You don't want to be in the film study because <laughs> you're going to get clowned. But during those years, uh, some of your teammates, obviously, uh, you think of linebackers, uh, and of course you think of Robert Jones immediately, um, Buckets Award finalist, he got robbed, uh, as we all know, uh, and then you also had the likes of Jerry Dillon, Ken Burnett, and so yep. many others. Talk about some of your memories of your uh, teammates, um, be it linebackers or just or other individuals on the team. You know, linebacker, you know, being a linebacker is, 
I don't know, it's, it's such a brotherhood. It's so different from any other position. And I'm being biased, but, like, I know this. I mean, when you're a backer, I mean, you, you, I mean you're a backer. And, and I remember, like, our linebacker coach at the time, Coach Hux, um, there were things that Coach Hux brought and brought to the table for us that was new for us that really changed the entire outlook of the backers, um, like how we play and the things that we would do. Um, for example, like when we would, when we have, have our physical tests, you know, linebackers have a, a certain time that they need to get in, um, say miles or, or 40 times, but Coach Huck's, his expectation was for us to be as fast as skill position. So there was a lot of competition. There's a lot of um a lot of heated heated practices. I mean brutal practices. But you know, we get in the locker room, you know, it's all one family. But there's something about being a backer. And I don't wanna because when you're a backer, I I don't care what anybody says, like you're always a linebacker. You know, you, former linebacker this and former linebacker that. Um, and that group, um, you know, you, you had Rob and you had Ken. Ken, um, you know, had, had, was the elder statements of the group because he had been there, um, so long and he'd seen the hardship of, you know, not competing like we should have. Um, but that, that group, that group, that team, um, it was, you know, to take something from uh, <laughs> from Coach Baker, like we had one heartbeat um, as as a unit, um, and we supported each other every which way you can imagine. Um, and it was a special unit. It really is. It really was a special unit. Uh, moving on um, from your time at ECU, kind of br- bring us up to date. Uh, talk about what you did after ECU. Um, did you have an opportunity in the, the professional ranks, what have you, and then um, yeah, and, and bring yeah. – sorry, go ahead. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, no, I was go. just going to say, and, and then after you talk about that, uh, bring us up to date to the present. All right. Um, well, I had um, had opportunities um, in Canada. Um, there was a time when the Canadian expanded to uh, four of the U.S. cities, and I had an opportunity um, with the Vegas team. Um, and it didn't, didn't work out the way that I wanted to. And, you know, you know, you get to a point, man, where you just like, I just want to play football. I, I just really want to play football. And, you know, you, you're ready. You're trying to, you're ready to go to this tryout and that tryout. And it gets to a point where you just, and, it, and the hardest thing that I've ever done in my life is, is stop chasing that. Like, it gets to a point where you have to grow up and you have responsibilities and you just can't just drop that to go to this tryout and try after this. It comes to a point where you just have to be a realization. Well, you know, I've – and it's, it's hard when you've been been an athlete your entire life to say, well, I'm not I'm not going to make it or I'm not good enough. But it comes to a point where you have to make a, a rational decision where, like, you have to move on with your life. Toughest thing that, that I've ever had to do. I mean, I watch the game as a player now. I, um, you know, when Robert was, was still in the league, when Jeff was still in the league and some of my other teammates, I played through those guys watching them on the, on the, uh, on television. Um, and, uh, once I finally, Gave everything up. I, I moved back home. My my coach from my school asked me to come out and coach the freshman team. I was like, yeah, cool. And um, I got hooked on being around the kids. Um, I'm always asking, like, well, how was your day in class and this and this and that. And that led me to go and get my certification to be become an educator. So I, I taught for a while. Um, I was a principal at a private school. Um, in Orlando for years. Um, I was in the uh, school system for years. Um, 
I left the school system and uh, went to school full time to get my master's. The economy hit us um, where they were laying off teachers, not doing rehires. I was actually working at a Best Buy, and I, they actually paid for my graduate degree. Um, and once they pay for it, you have to kind of work it off a little bit. So I was in retail for a little bit, um, just about to get my own store when I had an opportunity with Google. Um, I am currently a territory sales manager for Google. Um, it's an amazing job. Um, I can pretty much set my schedules, had autonomy to do, you know, whatever I need to do and take care of and go have lunch with my son if I want to. It's just it's just a great um a great opportunity that I got and like I still I still miss being around um the kids um in terms of education. But right now I wouldn't trade this for anything. It is an awesome experience. Now, obviously, I mean, you're down there in Orlando, uh, so obviously you love any time the Pirates make those trips down to UCF and USF. And then also um, with the American Athletic Conference, we have tremendous exposure on ESPN's platforms where uh, if you can't attend a game in Greenville or wherever the Pirates are playing, play. playing yeah. you, you always have the opportunity to watch on the, on the two. Yeah. And I think that's probably one of the, the biggest things uh, for ECU is getting in a conference because – when 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 I played at ECU, we were independent. Like, we didn't belong to any conference. Um, and um, you know, once the conference came along, then you're going to get some more of that um, media um, that they have now. And like, just the beautiful facilities. And uh, I'm telling you, uh, uh, Saturday in Greenville game day is special. And you know, a lot of times they get the opportunity to watch that. And when when ECU does come to town, I, I'll go out um, to UCF. I won't go to USF because um, of it's just a little bit more of a drive for me. But when it comes to UCF, I'm I'm always there. Um, and you you would be amazed of the amount of people who travel to these games. Um, but I get out and see them all the time. And actually, there is a local bar. Um, when I was uh, when I was a dean, um, we get there was one of my students was working at this drive thru and his doctor came to this drive thru and he had all this ECU stuff on his car. And um, my student said, "Hey, my dean went to that school." And actually gave him the name of the school and everything, and uh, he wound up calling me. And like, there's a there's a bar, an ECU bar that has all the pirate games on it on the weekends. It's 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 awesome because I don't get a whole lot of that here in Orlando, especially with the success um, lately that uh, UCF has had. But it's a great way to get out and escape and feel like I'm back in the in the purple and gold. <laughs> Ernie, of course, like I mentioned in the open, um, year one of Mike Houston, um, very successful at a number of different levels, high school, Division two, and FCS at James Madison most recently. Uh, so um, tell us what you what you know about Coach Houston and uh, how you see things um, shaping up uh, with the return of the likes of Coach Shank, uh, a guy that was on staff way back when you, when you were at ECU. Um, how do you see things going into 2019 season and beyond? I'm very optimistic. Um, I, 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 every year, you know, it's the same thing. It's like, you know, like when are we going to, you know, get that prominence back? Um, I love the fact that Coach Shank is coming back because we've had, like, we've had some, like, we've had some amazing coaches. We've had some really big time coaches. And when I tell people, well, hey, yeah, that used to be my coach at ECU or whatever, and, like it's hard to to believe that. But I think you know, getting getting this group that we have now, and um, having some of that old blood back, I, I'm just looking forward to us competing. Because like I'm a realist, and I understand like it doesn't happen overnight, and there's a, has to be a couple um, factors that come in to make it special. But I am just really looking forward 
to us getting out and competing because it just feels like, you know, there's been a couple seasons where we just really didn't compete. Um, so I'm just hoping that we're going to be competitive and we can just start to get this thing turned around, and I'm excited about Steve. Absolutely, the the competitiveness and then also uh, enhanced physicality and uh, more sure tackling uh, are things that uh, I know you're going to see uh, under Mike Houston in this regime, uh, no doubt about it. Um, well, Ernie, we certainly appreciate your time. You've been very generous this, uh, this morning as we've called up. Um, certainly appreciate everything that you did uh, for the Pirates during your time in the purple and gold and that you'll do in the future. And um we ho- hope to have you back on the show and down down the road. Uh, so, so um, have an excellent su- have an excellent summer. I'm sorry. I go ahead. Yeah, I, I I appreciate the opportunity, man. And anytime that you guys need anything from me, um, please don't hesitate. <laughs> That concludes this edition of 50 Pirates in 50 Days on the Sports Objective. Remember, join us daily between now and game day as we'll talk pirate football with players from various eras. All these interviews are available exclusively on SoundCloud and our YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe and follow so you're alerted when we post new content. Thank you so much for listening, and as always, Go Pirates!